Thank you. Uh, my name is Father Tad Paholchik. I'm the Director of Education for the National Catholic Bioethics Center based in Philadelphia. Uh, and I work as a bioethicist. I was formerly a scientist doing uh, cloning genes that are expressed in the human brain for a number of years. And I've been following this area uh, very closely uh, in, in my work. And of course, I would like to focus specifically for a couple of minutes on the ethical concerns as well. Uh, I'm convinced that this notion that we need to have a kind of science that is through and through ethical is so critically important, precisely because science is such a radical power in our midst. And when that power is not carefully circumscribed by good ethics, that power can turn into a raw exploitative force that is very, very damaging. And embryonic stem cell research is one very clear instance of this, where what is being proposed to become, as it were, standard medical practice is to encourage the direct destruction of younger members of the species in the interests of older ones. In other words, there's a type of discrimination that is being implicitly accepted. Not a discrimination based on skin color or origin, but a discrimination based on size or age. And that, of course, is a very unjust kind of a proposal intrinsically and one that any civilized society and certainly any group of responsible lawmakers should stand very strongly and directly opposed to because that challenges the very root of our belief that all men are created equal. If we acknowledge that some are more equal than others, we have begun the very unfashioning of our own society. So this argument that we need ethical science is critical, and I think that in understanding this issue, there's perhaps one argument here that I want to address very directly, and it's one that you have heard almost consistently in all of the previous testimonies. And it was the argument that goes like this. Well, all these embryos that are in the deep freeze are going to be discarded anyway. Oh, they're just going to be thrown out. They're going to be flushed down the toilet. How can you possibly not try to get some good out of that situation, in a sense, to try to redeem that? And I think this is an incredibly seductive argument. And I think most Americans have actually fallen prey to this in a utilitarian kind of a calculus that good ends will indeed justify intrinsically disordered steps. I mean, what's, what's really the bottom line here with that proposal? The bottom line is, is this. We're saying to ourselves, look, somebody over there in that fertility clinic is going to do harm to these embryos, is going to do evil to them, throwing them out. I think we all agree that there's, there's something wrong happening in this idea that we should throw out the embryos. So what do we do? We don't take the morally courageous position and say, let's stop the discarding of embryos. Rather, we choose somehow to cave in and say, therefore, that person is going to do harm to these embryos. Let's jump in line ahead of them and just do the harm ourselves first. Let us become the moral agents who cause the death of the embryo in the petri dish. And that is always an unacceptable kind of proposal that we can jump ahead in the line of evil to be those who carry out first. So the issues here, in terms of solid ethics, are very, very substantive ones. And I think at most there was some good service that was offered in prior testimony to the effect of having some oversight tools and so on. But the basic question was simply tacitly assumed to have been resolved. And I think that's a very grave error for us to succumb to. So we have real goods here, and I want to encourage you 
to not support this House bill, which not only supports this kind of research in the abstract or in theory, but actually concretely promotes it by making funding and very significant funding available. And remember, once that happens, anybody who works in ethics can tell you how quickly dollars will skew the ethical analysis in unjust directions. So I encourage you to vote no on House Bill Number One. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions, Delegate Murray? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was listening for an alternative when you talked about um, discarding of the frozen embryos. Um, have you some kind of a movement to use them in another fashion? Yeah, I, I would offer a couple of thoughts on that point. One would be that the whole question, I think you'd agree, is a very awkward one, and it should be raising bigger questions for us, questions of the sort, shouldn't we be passing laws like Italy and Germany have Laws which specify that you may only produce exactly as many embryos when you do in vitro fertilization as you will implant. You may not make extras, you may not make spares, you may not freeze them, you may not experiment on them, you may not clone them. That's what their laws state. And in Germany, you know how many frozen embryos they have? About 30. In the United States, we have more than 400,000. But they only have 30 in Germany. And the reason they even have 30 is because the couples that went to do it uh, went back home after they donated sperm and egg. And when they were driving back to the clinic to be implanted, got in a car accident and they were both killed. So they, or the wife was killed anyway. And so they couldn't implant those embryos. So at a minimum, I think these kinds of issues should be challenging us to look at the whole question of producing in vitro embryos. Now, is there something that could be done if we could stop the production of new embryos as we should in good moral conscience do? Well, that's a more complicated question. Um, I'm not sure that there is a simple solution. President Bush, Bush has mentioned about embryo adoption uh, and there is a movement afoot, but I think there are some very practical issues there that uh, would still not resolve the whole issue cleanly. And uh, I think the problem then would ultimately have to resolve itself to one of two other solutions. Could you make an artificial machine, like an artificial incubator, like we put preemies into now, put in an embryo and gestate those embryos that way, so that they would then be born? It's a very unpleasant kind of a scenario, having no mother who raises you. But I simply offer that as one intellectual possibility. Uh, and the second possibility, and that's called ectogenesis, by the way, and the Japanese are working on that kind of a, of a machine, an artificial uterus. Uh, and the second possibility here is simply to wait with these frozen embryos. There's some indication that if you freeze an embryo today, thaw it tomorrow morning, you have a great chance of successfully thawing it. But if you freeze it today and wait 35 years, you have a lower probability of effectively thawing that embryo. So it appears some of them may be dying by themselves in the deep freeze. And if we simply wait, then after we could figure out the curves of decay and say, all right, after 1,500 years, uh, we can thaw them all. They're already dead by themselves. We didn't cause their death directly by becoming those who thaw them and destroy them for their stem cells and actively cause their death. But I, it's an awkward situation, I think you'd agree. None of the solutions are clean. All of it should be reminding us of the kinds of grave transgressions that have taken place in terms of bringing these embryos into existence in the first place. So the bottom line is there is nothing, no strategy in place at this particular point in time, just theories in terms of what could happen. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony today. Let's bring up the next.